So these people we just brought up are all people who are working on the Morrison Creek project in one form or another. They're part of the partnership. Um, just quick introductions. <clears throat> Molly Fellero works at DWR in another program other than the Riverine Stewardship Program, but we steal her time as much as we can. And she's um, one of our main contacts now between the community and the department. Um, Greg and Christine are working for the um, Foothill Watersheds, uh, Watershed Collaborative. Watershed Collaborative. Watershed Collaborative. Collaborative, excuse me. Watershed Collaborative. And they're <laughs> intimately involved in the integrated regional water management planning documents for the CABI watershed and are helping members of that, um, that funding area apply for grants and manage um, revenues flowing through for projects. So they're helping us on this in the same vein, helping us try and solicit some additional funding and help plug this project into the water, wider watershed context for us. Okay. So uh, what I, we'd like to do now is just open it up for questions about uh, the Morrison Creek project or environmental justice um, issues in general, um, using Morrison Creek as sort of our example to respond with. Does anybody got questions? And while I walk over there, if Vern, you're not going to come up, I'll tell you how he connects. <laughs> so uh, part of our effort uh, is to, we see an organization in DWR that's doing good community-based work within an agency that, are we being recorded, is not especially well known for doing that type of work. And so we see a, a group that we want to help elevate uh, and make sure that they have the resources so that the, their, their methodology, their approach will bleed over into other portions of that agency's work. Burn here, uh, it was out beating the, beating the uh, legislators with the message that this is environmental justice work, this is work you should support, and got a good, a good healthy chunk of resources uh, on, out of the legislature. So thanks for that, Burn. So my, my question relates directly to the sign, and uh, we're from, I'm from Oregon actually, and uh, my initial question would be, who put up the sign, and whoever put up the sign must have some sort of authority over the creek, I would assume. And uh, so how do you, whoever that is, how do you bring them into your process? It's, it's a great question. Um, I couldn't find the answer other than looking up the code, but the, the bottom line is, is that uh, water's very dangerous and we have to keep people from it. That's the answer I kept on getting from a lot of people. And I just kind of think it's crazy. Um, but I don't know, I don't have an answer to that. I don't know who put up the sign and uh, it's, it's there, the gates are locked. I, I do know that talking to the county, the county was willing to give us the keys to open up the gates if we needed to get out there, but not, not to take them down yet, so. The, the city actually owns the property, so this is part of engaging all the stakeholders for example, getting the National Park Service grant, we had to get support letters from the property owner, which is the city, but this is actually, um, the, the area is managed by someone else under a long-term contract, a, another agency, and then you also have a flood control agency that controls it upstream and downstream. So we managed to get the support letters to move forward. So we're identifying all those stakeholders and bringing them to the table but they want to keep people out because of a safety issue and then trash, and we want to restore it. So we're bringing everybody together with the help of the state and, and the community engagement partners and Environmental Justice Coalition for Water. I was just wondering, but there's a lot of questions to ask about this, but this is just a segment of Morrison Creek, right? Yes. Is it also a flood conveyance? So you'll have to take that into account in your design yeah. then. Uh, also, are you, are you planning on removing the cement and doing any meandering or any reconfigure reconfiguring of the, of the um, elevations or, or the sides or, I mean, it, how It all depends on their the vision from the community and what they want. Um, but there is, I've already talked to Safeca, and there's some opportunity if you look at adjacent properties um, and some of those assets we were talking about in there to maybe um, have have an area where uh, a retention area where you can hold some water back from going down and 
actually uh, increase the capacity of of what of what's going in that creek. So, and there's there's a property off of 65th where we think we can do that. So, so in your in your talks with the community right now, are, are you do you do any talking about habitat? Uh, what a creek can bring to a community as far as wildlife yes. is concerned and things. So some pr kind of education and then letting them work off of that as to whether they just want to see it look like that but maybe have it open with a pathway beside it. So the visioning process, we see this whole, we're very early in this, in this project and we see it going from a vision to a concept to a design we're in the visioning step now. And part of the issue in working with disadvantaged communities is they may not even recognize the potential of what they have. And so part of the discussion right now is to talk to them about what they like about the creek, what they don't like about the creek, what they think they might be able to do with the creek going forward. As far as moving the, the banks around, the bed around, we have limited ability to do that, but there is some ability to do that. And depending on what the community decides they want to pursue, we'll try and develop a plan that, that meets that to the best of our ability. There are a few places, as Mark said, where we could widen the channel. We could use those widening spaces to offset narrowing or otherwise putting some kind of constriction in otherwise. Even with no adjustment of the channel itself, there's still an ability to bring a lot of riparian character back to this channel that isn't there now, that, you know, it's basically star thistle and barnyard grass kind of uh, banks. There's not a lot of habitat value there. Even within the flow regime we have now and the contours we have now, there's ability to enhance that component. There's ability to enhance access to the creek and use it as an asset rather than as a, you know, a screened off uh, waste areas, which is it's sort of seen as right now. Uh, there's water quality issues all throughout Sacramento in terms of their stormwater permits, um, and this is a stormwater conveyance system. So um, we would have, we do have water quality concerns, and we do. There are water quality permits that we're going to have to manage. Um, but again, we'll look at that more carefully as we decide what the scope of the project really is going to be. From, from the perspective of getting to the point through the visioning to where we can find out what the community wants, it's very difficult for the small nonprofits to find that funding. So what we've done is work collaboratively to get funding for the staffing to help manage this visioning and to get the National Park Service in so that we can get this project in agreement with the state, with the local government agencies and the community to the point where we have enough plans that we can apply for construction funds. So you're, you're at a point where this takes a lot of time and manpower, particularly with a community that doesn't have a staff person for their, their, their community group, their neighborhood association. So we're working back and forth and the staff person from Environmental Justice Coalition for Water is doing a lot of that. So it's a cooperative effort with a lot of groups to try to help a community decide what they want and if it's possible and then go from there. So we're looking, when I'm the one who helps with the grant writing and fundraising for going to the foundations and, and different areas, we're looking at trying to have this done in for the cycle for two years out. So a year of a real visioning and taking the community members out to other restored creeks so they can see what they might want and go through a process guided with the National Park Service. They've been doing this in other areas to, to get a product out there that we can put out for grants and to get it done. So, and then the state has money for uh, helping with the modeling. And so it's lots of pots of money pulling to get the staffing to get it done. It, that, it's amazing um, what you know, we take for granted on working on uh, some of our own projects and, uh, you know, when the challenges that disadvantaged communities have from, uh, you know, that it was, it was remarkable to me. I, I, I had, and I was naive. I was like, oh, we, we just go look at the parcels, you know, and a lot of the people in the community didn't even know where to begin to do that. This are some simple things. Um, 
oh, you go look at the 303D list and, and we'll tell you about water. They didn't even know, you know, and, and that's, it's, um, it's, it was a real eye-opening experience for me when I first started working there, and, and I didn't, I don't assume anything now. I, I give out as much information as I can and, and try to help. The, they also question, operate question in a different back. time frame. Every organization that's involved, the nonprofits, the community itself, the state agency, the local governments, all operate on their own time frame and all have their own agenda. So we're trying to get it all aligned. So giving the support to the disadvantaged community so they can move faster to, to, to provide input is really important. Turns out Mark's also a very good listener with all the expertise in the community. Question in the back. Uh, I'm Gordon Lepic with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And uh, first, I want to thank you for this topic. It is vitally important, and I don't think it gets a lot of airplay. Uh, there's a real movement in the, um, in the public health community about working toward uh, community resilience and cohesion and connectedness. And um, in my work uh, with my team trying to restore riparian habitats and wetland habitats, I've put forth this idea that when we restore riparian corridors, we're also, these aren't just wildlife corridors, but these are people corridors. And in doing so, we're also helping bring about community connectedness and restoration and resilience. And, uh, you know, quite frankly, I've been kind of laughed at. And I was absolutely laughed at and said, well, that's, you know, that's kind of a stretch. And, and I mentioned this to Mark it's earlier. It's not. <laughs> yeah, it's not. And, and I would take it one step further and say we're not only restoring the natural community, but we're affecting divorce rates. And we're keeping families together. It has to do with diabetes. It has to do with obesity. When we can get people out in the community in these wild areas, we're connecting both the wildlife and the wild areas to the urban areas and to the, the community. So my question to you is this, how do we promote this idea of um, restoring rivers and streams and riparian corridors with restoring and enhancing and promoting resilience and connectivity in our human communities? Because it's really not there and we need to get the word out. I, I, my answer to you is, is that we, we as practitioners and, and we're out there, we have to make that connection and, and show it. Uh, I, I go back to Kaiser. Uh, I think, um, I, I don't think your conversation at all, Gordon, is crazy at all. I think Kaiser would, would say, okay, show me the project that you want funded and, and let's talk about it because I think they get it. They have the epidemiological data. They have all of that data to make that human health connection to water. And um, they saw that from the get-go with Morrison Creek. So um, I, I, would, I would look for opportunities um, in projects. I mean, Morrison Creek is a natural. It already has um, a built-up area where you could, in theory, if you unlock the gates now, you could be walking a mile a day along that and having the experience of, of what it is now. But maybe it enhanced in the future. So I think we, we have to look at our projects and, and connect those dots uh, and, and go out to uh, sell the projects that way and pitch it that way. And that's my answer to that question. You know, I'd just say on that issue that um, it's, uh, it's important to get there are lots of organizations like Harz Valley uh, Foothill Watersheds Collaborative and the, sort of the seed organization for that is Dry Creek Conservancy. There's another one in, in the Sacramento area called Sac Area Creeks Council and there are numerous ones. There are lots of people that are really interested in waterways, of course. And um, then there's a sort of a super organization that Vern is associated with that uh, Colin just mentioned a little while ago, which is trying to find that connection between legislation and the things that we do in the state at the agency level and all of these little nonprofits that 
are overlooked as being really the heart of this kind of a movement. That's, that's where this starts. It doesn't start at an agency level. It really starts from the people that live there that are interested in getting it done and don't have a staff and uh, the ability to organize the activities that they want to get done. So that's kind of what our approach is, is to try and provide a, a bridge or a link between those people that live there and the, the resources of the state. Maybe Vern at some point will want to say a little bit about his activities in trying to, to do that. Another thing I wanted to add is that we have the power as, as for our vote. Um, SB 5 uh, was signed yesterday, I think, and um, I'm making a pitch for it. It's going to be a proposition. It's going to lay out a lot of money. Uh, vote yes for it because it will ad directly affect with um, and provide funds for uh, in, in a competitive grant situation for parkways uh, and um, projects like Morrison Creek. There'll be a disadvantaged community component to it and we'll be getting more people to those riparian areas that we so love dearly. And importantly, there's also a, an affordable housing component uh, coming up in June, which will be the backbone potentially to the affordable housing uh, development side of what we need to do here. You had a question? Okay, I had the comment and a question, and it was about SB5 and that the appetite really is out there for those multi-benefit projects. Um, so I'm from Southern California, and I actually had a site visit for a project quite similar to this about, you know, access, to connectivity for residents and, and flood control. And one of the challenges that has come up is around um, FEMA designations and house home insurance going up because you're in a flood zone. And I was just wondering, through these, through these types of projects where there, there's so many positives um, and then the negative is that the, the, the homeowner's insurance is going to go up. Are, you know, what, have you had that hurdle and how are you approaching that? And it's like because what's happening is, um, especially in my community that I'm thinking of, is there is a need from disadvantaged communities to have that access, but then the residents who live there aren't necessarily zoned as disadvantaged community. And it's like where the, the different types of communities in your watershed are at opposite ends of the table and how you address that through that community engagement and what assets you have available to you. I'm going to let Colin take that one. <laughs> He's going to kick me. <laughs> Yeah, uh, so the, the question about uh, flood insurance uh, rising is, uh, is one that's very much on our study radar. Uh, we've had conversations briefly with the folks at the Sacramento Area Flood Control Agencies, Agency. Um, and um, you mentioned the zoning piece of it. Uh, most of the corridor along uh, Morrison Creek is zoned residential, but some of it is mixed use. Um, and we're, we're going to be, we don't have any numbers yet to know what those rates would be. And I'm not a flood insurance uh, expert, but I do know that uh, that'll be part of the mix of considerations that we take into account. Um, does that, anyone else have any other well, deeper insights? Well, I, think, I think also, and Stefan's grabbing the mic, but w when we introduce a project, we're not going to increase any flood risk. That's a goal of the project, too. So that's, you know, it's part of the program, and um, any project visioning or concepts are really going to be played through that. So we're not going to increase the flood risk. Yeah, the FEMA process requires a letter of map revision if you're going to change the flood dynamics and change the propose to change the designations. And there's a mechanism for us to evaluate that and, and provide data to FEMA to accommodate uh, a change in the flow patterns. But the bottom line is we can't increase the flood risk if, from the project. So in the in Morrison Creek case, uh, we don't think that's going to be a big problem. We think the channel is somewhat oversized for the flood capacity it's carrying now. And even with the build out anticipated in the watershed, um, we think there's plenty of room in the, in the channel to do some stuff and, and not have to worry too much about the flood risk. In other channels in, in urban areas, that's not the case. And so there's a much 
much narrower envelope to, of design that you can work with in those settings. Um, but, you know, we haven't gone through the whole FEMA analysis yet, so we don't really have an answer for your question about how to do it. You know, what, what aspects of this project were successful or not successful in addressing FEMA's concerns? Well, just quickly to tag on to that, as you look at that um, area photo, there is potentially really great flood space. And it would be so great, to, not to add more to your plate, but to work with FEMA on that concept of, like Napa um, town, the town of Napa did with their floodplain, uh, or their downtown, they opened it up and allowed the river to flood. So I, I don't know if there's any talk about that. There's not talk about letting this area flood, but there is talk in the community about addressing the flood issue from a, a flood a stormwater flow perspective and trying to retrofit individual parcels and retrofit spaces that are more broadly that feed into the creek before it gets to the creek and address the flood peaks by retaining water or slowing it um, in, in the in the immediate area. We the problem with that is that the neighborhood could do that, but the flood zone for this creek is much bigger than the neighborhood. So we have to go beyond this and start talking about a much, you know, a sort of a micro-regional area um, in that context. And there's, you know, the city of Sacramento is, is not really interested in engaging in that discussion right now at, at a level of detail that would help us on this project. But it is possible that this project advances that whole stormwater BMP envelope. And, and looks for other ways to address stormwater than just in-channel mechanisms. So we're, we are also in the process of developing a stormwater management plan. So part of the role of Valley Foothill Watershed Collaborative is to help identify projects that have multiple benefits, like Morrison Creek. We are going to work to have it established as one of the, the potential projects on the list for the plan as a model and then some others. So in this context, this small section, we have agreement with SAFCA, which controls upstream and downstream, and the city to look at it and what can be done. And then there are potential for other projects along Morrison Creek. So it, it's part of, it's been identified, the regional planning group that we're part of knows. So we're in that process. We have a, we have a draft plan. Uh, seeing as this is a public funding project, are there viable venues for incorporating volunteers in the regulatory or the design or the monitoring stage for such projects, or does that have to that's be? That's what we're all about. <laughs> so you're all pro bono? Well, that's, that, so when it's said and done, the small nonprofits that are all volunteer-based, volunteer boards, which is in this case, it's Sacramento Area Creeks Council. This is in their group. They're one of the founding members of Valley Foothill. We will be the ones who will be left behind training volunteers. We do Creek Week in Sacramento. We do International Coastal Cleanup. We have Adopt a Creek projects. So we'll work and train the community to do that. And then it can be tapped in. I also teach at CSU Sacramento. So we'll, we'll tap it in as a project We'll, and then we'll work um, with the school districts. So that will come through, and there will be ongoing monitoring from that standpoint. So volunteer-based. So Molly's been talking to the community a lot, and, and she's actually putting a lot of volunteer time on this project already. But um, do you have anything to add on marshalling the volunteers? The only thing that I feel like is missing from so far what we've talked about is um, how homelessness, and I think in Sacramento it's a huge issue. Many of the homeless are camping out on the American River Parkway, and I do think it's something we'll have to discuss as part of, you know, living in an urban area, and this is really, you know, what's happening, so. But otherwise, the community, we're just out working with the community and trying to engage people, it's just hard to reach people because they don't always come out. So that's the challenge is to find, you know, get people to come out so you can actually engage with them. 
<laughs> One comment. Okay. Quick. Okay, because because Mark's from DWR and and you know with Integrated Regional Water Management Program, we have these committees and you put your projects out there, but the reality is. Uh, you only talk about those projects as a community. What happens oftentimes is you have a flood control district and their mandate is flood control. And then what happens is, you know, an alternative or concept will come out and then it's the community's opportunity to comment. And I kind of feel like through IRWM, like th that program, people should be coming up front. You know, it shouldn't be reactionary. We shouldn't be trying to change the project once it's got to a concept de development stage, it, it should be, you should be incorporating that multi-benefit from the get-go. Um, and it shouldn't just be the suite of projects that get funded in that funding cycle, it should be in the planning, it should be an ethos at the county level or city planning level. And I think there's, there's a disconnect in that program in that regard. And we're trying to address that disconnect because we're also Valley Foothill Watershed Collaborative is working with the group with the, the rewrite, re up, um, the updating the ERWIMP. And again, we are identifying and we are pushing that we want the multi-benefit projects in. And we're tasked with identifying the projects to be put in and ongoing with the ongoing updates. So this is the kind of project we're looking for. And others that they've talked about along Auburn Ravine, Coon Creek, there, so for our watershed, that's what we're trying to do. But again, these nonprofits and the environmental groups are almost all, I'm, uh, um, all volunteer, all volunteer, volunteer boards. So unless they have someone there speaking when the meetings are during the work day, so that's what we've done, and we formed a regional collaborative to represent those groups. And in this instance, uh, EJCW is actually going to be doing the work for the American River Basin IRWM on uh, disadvantaged community involvement under Proposition 1, which tying back to Molly's uh, uh, raising, highlighting the issue of homelessness will include in the underrepresented communities component of that program a specific um, community-based project around homelessness, access to water and sanitation, but also flood risk, and how can we flip that script so that uh, for one, we can address homelessness directly, but also the health and safety impacts um, and, and the flood control uh, challenges in a, in a humane way that actually creates some jobs uh, so that homeless can become stewards of the flood, flood channels along which they often live. All right, with that, we're going to have to cut it off. Jim has a couple of announcements he's going to make, and then we'll break. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.